All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I want to welcome you to the Barbara Lee and Elliot Harris Lecture Series. Uh, we have a magnificent night in store for you. Um, we have a full house. Who knew there were so many quilt enthusiasts in, in Oakland, California? <laughs> You all look wonderful. My name is Royal Roberts, and I will be the MC uh, for the program this evening. And we'll be introducing um, various people throughout the night. Um, I want to, again, welcome you all, as others will do shortly. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Barbara Lee and Elihu Harris Lecture Series, this is our 24th lecture. And over time, yes, yes. So we'll clap for that. <laughs> and over time, um, we have brought various icons um, to the city of Oakland um, under the guidance of Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Mr. Elihu Harris here, the Honorable Elihu Harris, which you'll hear more about later. <laughs> And, and the idea is to bring the classroom to us um, and us to, to sit down at the feet and learn from these civil rights icons, um, these people who bring so much to our community and also to humanity. Tonight, as you will learn, um, the life, the experiences, um, is about much more than, than quilts and about much more than quilting. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the free, Martin, Luther, G, Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center, it is an organization that has been changing the lives of young people in Oakland and the greater Bay Area for many years. Youth learn how to change their conduct, change their character, and ultimately change their consciousness. Um, this organization, as you'll hear from some of our young leaders today, uh, has made a long-lasting uh, input on, on their souls. So, moving on to our next person on the program, um, I have the honor and the privilege of introducing Dr. David M. Johnson. And <laughs> I will read a little bit of his bio, which you all have in front of you in the program. Um, but then I'll add a little bit of extra flavor, context. <laughs> so David M. Johnson, which I know stands for Miles, David <laughs> Miles Johnson, is the president of Merritt College in Oakland, California. In this role, he is responsible for the overall academic and fiscal direction of the instruction. His experience as a teacher and as an administrator, coupled with his appreciation for the value of collegial and consultative decision-making, have been invaluable in helping him lead Merritt College. Dr. Johnson holds a bachelor's in mass communication from UC Berkeley, a master's in communication from the University of Washington, and a doctorate in history from UC Berkeley. And among that, I can tell you that he is an advocate of students, learning, increasing enrollment in the Peralta Community College District, and helping young men and women rise to the next level. Without any further ado, I would like to bring to you Dr. David Johnson. I may owe him a little bit of money after that. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing tonight? All right. All right. See, Royal wasn't lying. You guys do look good. Um, I'm pleased to be here with you tonight uh, to support our partner, the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center, under the leadership of Dr. Roy Wilson. And just a little background, Merritt College has been home to the Freedom Center for, for some time now, and the value and virtue of that association has been a source of great pride and gratitude. 
Now, this evening's presentation, which is the latest in the Barbara Lee and Ellie Hugh Harris lecture series, I think reinforces our appreciation for the center and perhaps more importantly, brings our view of the critical importance of civic engagement into sharper focus. These quilters and the cultural artifacts that they have bestowed upon the world continue to bear witness to the power, perseverance, and poignancy of the African-American experience. And these works of art, we gain a deeper understanding of what it means to be a fully realized human being, despite whatever the prevailing economic, social, and or racial barriers might be. In these quilts, we are reassured that these things can be surmounted and that the wisdom, strength, and beauty that rests in each of us can shine through. We marvel at the creativity, the precision, the artisanship reflected in this collection and know at once that these quilts are nothing short of cultural conduits that continue to inform and inspire us. So with that, I wanna welcome you all. And I also uh, say that I'm humbled to be in the presence of these amazing women, these Petway sisters, and who've come to share their story tonight. And I also wanna give a, a quick plug, make sure that you visit the Joyce Gordon Gallery between now and March, 21st, March 25th before the, uh, before the exhibition ends. And it looks like a per perfect segue. I think I'm supposed to be introducing you next to come on up and say a few words. <laughs> Joyce Gordon. Greetings, everyone. Greetings. I'm really excited to be here today. Excited to have the uh, G Spins exhibit at the gallery. And it's really special today because it is my 20th anniversary with the gallery. So I'm just really pleased. We're having a uh, reception for the G Spins uh, quilters on Wednesday, International Women's Day at the Joyce Gordon Gallery. So I look forward to seeing all of you there, all of you there. Okay. At 406 14th Street, Oakland. Today is really a great day in Oakland. I'm just really excited about this exhibit. Thank you. I think I need that. All righty, at this time, I would like to recognize um, our contributing sponsors as well as our supporter. And with that, I do want to recognize that there are so many hands that come together to make an event like this happen. Um, but our major contributors and sponsors um, really do a lot to lift up um, this particular program. So first we have Ask Me 32299. California Waste Solutions. The Golden State Warriors. IBEW Local 595. The Institute for Community Leadership. and the NorCal Carpenters Union. And also we have uh, our supporter, Blaisdells. I would also like to introduce the elected officials that we have record of. And if I miss you, you may raise your hand and shout out your name. Hopefully we, we will not miss you. Um, but if we do, blame it on the paper and not on me. <laughs> um, from Assemblymember Mia Bonta's office, we have Rowena 
Brown, District Director. <laughs> Mayor of Alameda, Mayor Marilyn Izzy Ashcraft. <laughs> From the office of the Mayor of Berkeley, we have Di Diana Delphine Polk. Or on the office of Mayor Jesse Utterdeen. And she's also one of the board members for Peralta Community College District. Let's give her a double hand. So at this time, if there are any other electives I missed, feel free to, to shout out. Um, and now, at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Roy Wilson. I just want to say a couple of words because Roy has been a mentor for me even when I worked as a youth leadership coach at the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center. And his vision, his guidance um, is what gives us the ability for all of your beautiful faces to be in this room tonight. So thank you and welcome Dr. Roy Wilson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I feel like singing a song for my generation. And I can't sing, so I won't, but the lines go something like this. Little darling, it's been a long, long, lonely winter. Here comes the sun. Here comes the sun. Uh-huh. All right, to get the picture. Thank you, uh, Brother Royal Roberts. It's a joy to be on your team, be on the same team. And I want to thank uh, all of our wonderful board members. Royal is our secretary and treasurer of the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Board of Directors. The Honorable Elu Harris is our chairman of the board. Mr. Alton Jelks is a board member, along with Ms. Uh, Kim Thompson, uh, Dr. William Riley, Mr. Michael Lighty, and I believe I got it. So, Royal, I'll probably take more heat than you if I miss somebody. <laughs> uh, the, um, many times we're asked, well, what is it that you do with those youth? Because the Freedom Center youth are extraordinary. And we're quick to let them know that they're not extraordinary. They're quite ordinary but they do accomplish extraordinary things. And they accomplish extraordinary things because they've dedicated this time of their life, and we hope it's a long, it's a lifetime dedication to the proposition of changing themselves through helping transform America, being something that's larger than themselves. Now, our curriculum is based on the work of Dr. King, and most of us know that Dr. King is misrepresented by the status quo. He's portrayed as a dreamer, and he honored America that was, and that is, and the forces of greed and hate still want us all to believe that Dr. King was talking about, does talk about, the way things are. That's not Dr. King's work. And the young people study what Dr. King was putting forward and marching for and living for and dying for, and that is, he was talking about an America that's never been, an America that must become. And these young women and men study and are advocates for the protection and promotion of democracy because they are preparing for the America that is to become. Thank you very much. And now, students from the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center, Ms. Jennifer Hernandez, and Miss Jada Gray, come on up. Jennifer is a senior in high school 
and a staff member for the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center. Jada is a graduate uh, and a former staff member, but she now is, a, well, she is a staff member for us in Washington, D.C. as a freshman at Howard University. Welcome, Jada and Jennifer. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We live in a time where our nation spends more time and money on military defense than on programs of social uplift. There's two realms. The first one is our external realm. Our external realm is anti-human. It focuses on me, my, and I. It focuses on materialism, what we buy, what we have, the phones we have, the cars we have. The health of our democracy relies on our ability to exercise our inner realm. Our inner realm is what keeps us human. It's what keeps us connected. It's our culture, our ability to love each other, to take care of one another, and know one another. Today, the beautiful woman of G-Spend reminded me that love is more than looking at someone and saying, I love you. But it's an act being able to feel, to touch, and to understand. But more than that, it's being able to look at the people that you love and say, I know that you can change, and pushing one another to become a better self. And that starts by looking at yourself too, by changing who you are. It starts with conduct. The health of our democracy depends on pro promoting and protecting culture. Thank you. All right. Uh, once again, good evening, everyone. There are these misconceptions about power, that power is durable, that's immovable and unchangeable. And there, uh, there's a reason why these systems of injustice and hate and greed are telling us that power is unchangeable. It's to quiet our hearts and our minds, to quiet our voices from proving that power is fragile. Power is the ability to achieve purpose and power is something we all hold. No institution, no system or individual can take away our cultural and spiritual power, our voices, our ability to make some good trouble within our community. Our voices are only quieted by our own fear and lack of courage. So right now in this time of challenge, of hardship, in this time of tension, we must utilize our own power, our own voices to make some change within our community. We have to tap on ourselves, on our neighbors to the left and right of us and command us to take a stand right now for justice, for hope and peace, to create that more perfect union and protect and preserve our democracy. Thank you. Now you see what I mean. <laughs> now you see what I mean. Um, at this time, again, I want to extend special thanks to all of the schools, organizations, churches, and individuals that have organized for this evening's lecture. Now, as you can see in your program, there is an exhaustive list of organizations um, and people and churches that have organized for this event. But now is the opportunity for you to put your virtual name on this same list. Because again, this program cannot happen without the support of each and every one of us. For those of you who have been to the lecture series before, 
This will not be new to you. And for those of you who have not, welcome. If you have the ability to, our young people will be walking down the aisles with little baskets. And in those baskets, the other side of that is in each of your programs, there are little envelopes. If you have the ability to donate any amount, it would be greatly appreciated. If you don't have any cash, like many people don't nowadays, <laughs> there are, there's an opportunity to take card payments in those secure envelopes or you can put down your information and someone can contact you at a later date to complete the donation process. But at this time, we ask if you could do whatever you can to support this programming and ensure that it continues to be open and free to anyone and everyone who would like to come and get these life lessons. So at this time, we're going to pause for a brief moment and allow you to make any donation you see fit. Thank you. To bring us back, I want to make one special introduction um, of someone who was the chairman of the Black Panther Party. We want to welcome Mr. Bobby Seale. Thank you so much for being here. Man. We are actually birthday twins. We were born on the same day. Facts. <laughs> so now we will move into the next segment of our program. Um, Congresswoman Barbara Lee is working hard for us. She couldn't be here this evening. But if we can please give her a resounding applause. Because we know she speaks for all of us in the assembly and hopefully soon in the city. But... <laughs> so now I'll introduce our special guests that are seated here on, on, the, on the stage. And I'm gonna go in the order. First, I will introduce the Honorable Elihu M. Harris, who will be our moderator for this evening. And, and I will read this short bio that's in the program, and then also, as I did with Dr. Johnson, say a, a couple of quick, quick words. But Elihu M. Harris, board chair of the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center, served as mayor of Oakland for two terms, yes, from 1991 to 1999. For 12 years, he served as a member of the California State Assembly, during which time he authored the historic 1981 legislation designating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday a California state holiday. <laughs> Mr. Harris received a master's degree in public policy from UC Berkeley and a law degree from UC Davis. Mr. Harris was chancellor of the Peralta Community College District from 2003 to 2010. And when you pull up his page, it says he's retired. That's not true. <laughs> he is one of the most busy retired people I've ever <laughs> known. He's a sagacious leader, a strategist, and also a mentor. So welcome to Mr. The Honorable Elihu Harris. <laughs> I will now read the bio, bios of our two distinguished quilters. First, Mary Ann Petway. 
Yes. Miss Marianne Petway was born and raised in G's Bend, Alabama, daughter of Lily Mae Petway and Paul T. Petway. Her mother, Lily Mae, was also a quilt maker and taught Marianne the art of quilting when she was young. As the seventh of 12 children, Marianne recalls the first quilt her mother taught her how to make. As the nine patch quilt, which was when she was seven, excuse me, six or seven years old. Then Marianne was in her early teens. Her mother took to research, excuse me, to teaching her quilt making. As an adult, she began quilting in earnest in 2005 and in 2006, was named general manager of the G's Bend Quilting Collective, a position she holds today. Marianne graduated from Pine Hill High School. I know your program says Pioneer, but it's Pine Hill High School in, Al in Alabama in 1975. She has worked in bookkeeping and accounting in addition to quilting over the years. She is a member of Pleasant Grove Missionary Baptist Church in G's Bend, where Pastor Pettis L. Lockett has presided for 30 years. Marianne has one daughter, Tabitha, who has four sons, age 5, 14, 15, and 20. Two of her grandsons are traveling with her this week. Can you please stand, grandsons, if you're here? There we go. Yes. Yes. Deshaun and Alexander, both are quilting, and their quilts are on display here this week. That is amazing. That is amazing. And for those of you who may have come in a little later and rushed in to get a seat, there are booths in the back with the quilts on display. So get a, please get an opportunity uh, to visit that, visit it, and, as well as um, Joyce Gordon's gallery. Next, I have the privilege and honor of introducing China Petway. And I will mention that it's no relation. They are not related, although they do share the same last name. <laughs> Miss China Petway was born in G's Bend, Boykin, Alabama, January 4th, 1952. Of her 10 siblings, four sisters and three brothers are living. They are the children of Miss Leola Petway and Willie Petway. Miss China is married with two children, a son and a daughter, and a grandson of seven months. All right. <laughs> Miss China graduated from Boykin High School and attended Selma University and Miles College in Birmingham, where she acquired a business degree. Miss Petway began quilting when she was nine years old, taught by her mother. Her first quilt was a star quilt. The family did not have materials for quilting and used the best part of worn clothing for pieces. Cotton scraps from the local gin house were swept up, beat and cleaned, and made into balls for, bat for batting and thread. She recalls quilting being used to keep the wind out of the house, to sleep on and under. Quilts were part of everyday life. It wasn't until 1999 that Miss China was introduced to the quilts as art and the historic contributions of the quilt of the quilting. She joined the quilting collective in order to travel and have the works of art and the significance of the quilt making history shared with others. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> so
So with that, while I receive the cards with the questions, I'm going to turn it over to the moderator, the Honorable Eliu Harris. Yes, sir. So can everybody hear me OK? Well, these are great microphones. I didn't know I was going to be able to sit here. I used to project my voice. Let's see. I start. Is, is the microphone? They want the mic up a little bit. OK. Turn okay. the, can you hear it now? A little better? OK. All right. You know, before Royal steps down, uh, you mean he's a little modest, but I want you to know a little bit about him. You heard that he was part of the Martin Luther King Freedom Center staff. And uh, that means he's part of the Martin Luther King Freedom Center family, as are all of you. This really is a family of people who we believe have a commitment to civic engagement, to nonviolent uh, resolution of conflict, and all the things that we believe Martin Luther King stood for when we talked about revolution of the mind, of the heart, of the spirit. And Royal is not only a outstanding uh, individual in his role as a board member of the Martin Luther King Freedom Center, but he also is a law school graduate. If you didn't look in the program, uh, he was the former general counsel of the Peralta Community College District, and he's now the chief deputy district attorney of Alameda County. So give Royal the hand. He did. <laughs> We're excited that you're here. We've had extraordinary speakers in the Martin Luther King Freedom Center uh, lecture series over the years. Uh, everyone from Andy Young and uh, John Lewis and on and on. People who really are pioneers in the struggle for justice and equality. And today is no exception. Uh, these two women are pioneers in what they do. Uh, they are carriers and teachers and people who are actually making sure that an art form that has been so vital in so many ways, as you'll learn, are not only keeping it alive, but teaching it to succeeding generations. And one of the things I think is important when you understand the history of what's going on in our world is that we have to really appreciate those who are willing to not only teach, but also to be willing to share uh, not only what they've learned, but the lessons that it teaches and things beyond the art, beyond things that they know and the things that it represents. You know, I didn't really know a lot about quilting. Uh, I didn't realize it was over 3,000 years old, mm -hmm. that in fact it had its birth in just survival. When people didn't have electric blankets or didn't have the kind of things, the blankets and other things that we have, uh, they made quilts. They used whatever they had to make the quilts. And not only was existing in, in 3,000 years ago, but it emerged out of the Crusades, out of Europe. Uh, it came here to this country. And as a result of the slave experience, many people who didn't have anything else had to use quilts as a way to keep warm and cold, windy uh, quarters often where there were no fires, no wood for fires, uh, and they used whatever they could find to make these quilts. But ultimately, they made something that was made out of scraps, a little bit of anything they could find, and made it into something that was not only beautiful, but often passed down from generation to generation, an heirloom, something that not only reminded them of the past, but also gave them a sense as to who they were. They may not have known where they came from originally for those who originated in Africa, but at least in this country, often that quilt would represent what their grandparents and generations before had done to make sure that there was a sense of the family, of its relationship and all the rest. So today we have two women who are exemplary of that tradition, who have taken that tradition and taken it from just a means of survival and made it into an art form. Now, my family grew up in Arkansas, and we grew up in a place called Tucker, Arkansas. And yes, we had quilts. Uh, my grandmother and great-grandmother and those before all learned about how to make a quilt. 
My grandmother came here from Arkansas. Uh, we had quilts that she brought from Arkansas that we had in our family. Those quilts, I don't, I don't know where they are. They may be in a chest somewhere in, in my house, but we haven't used those quilts. But after hearing the story of G's Bend, I got to go find those quilts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I want you to know something else that's important. You know, uh, we, we grew up in a place called Tucker, Arkansas. And the only thing I knew about Tucker, several things. One, that uh, there was a prison there and there'd been a plantation there. Uh, my grandfather was the principal of the school in Tucker, Arkansas. And I didn't find out until years later that even though he'd gone to college, he hadn't graduated. He went to college in 1908 and uh, didn't graduate till about 40 years later. And, uh, but at the time, if you graduated from the eighth grade, you'd graduated from school if you were black in Tucker, Arkansas. So, you know, we understand that it wasn't always easy trying to build a foundation, how to raise your family, how to get an education. But that's the tradition that these women represent. And more important than anything else, I don't understand, and I want them to explain to me, how they're both named Petway. Name <laughs> <laughs> me? From Jeansville, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not related. It's right. true. Now, wait, I know you got an answer for me, mm -hmm. but here's what I want to understand. There's a tradition, and those of you who may not be black may not have heard it, same plantation, no relation. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there was a G's bin or, or a Petway flat plantation, and, and that's the common uh, source of your name, but I do want to learn a little bit more about each of you All because right. uh, you guys have... Uh, come a mighty long way. And we want you to share your story and tell us a little bit about what G's Bin is all about, the history of G's Bin, and then we'll get into your personal history. So, Mary, I'm gonna start with you. Tell us a little bit about your history of growing up in G's Bend, Alabama, how you escaped and why you're going back. <laughs> Mr. Harris, well, well myself, um, I never escaped. <laughs> I never left. I was born and raised there in G's Bend. Uh, to answer the question to you, the Petway, I was told that we are not blood related. We got the name from Ma Petway. He was the plantation owner. And when they released them as slaves, they just kept the Petway name. Right. That's how it got to be so many Petway. Mm -hmm. And because see, some of the Petways are married Petways. Amen. And that's why they say they are not blood related. They answer the question to that, right? Yes. All right. <laughs> Okay, about myself and uh, growing up in G's Bend, I was born in 1956, December 22nd, 1956. That, that's what my mom and daddy told me. I don't know how. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but thank God that I am here. And yes, we have come a long way. Yes, God brought all of us across the sky from different places. And um, we are so happy to be here, to live there in G's Bend. You know, when I was growing up, I never knew that I was poor because, see, my mother, she always sought to us, always having something to eat, clothes to put on our back, and a roof over our heads. And coming about those quilts, um, you know, our houses was not as, as sturdy as they are now. We didn't have no, no, no walls or whatever, but anyway, the house that I was born and raised in, you know, it was better than some of the houses that, that uh, my parents may have came up in. You know, they used to live in shacks. And I, I was born and raised, um, I was old enough to get a chance to see some of those shacks. But our house is one of the houses that I was told that Roosevelt had built for 100 slaves that I came walk from North Carolina. And so once they got, got there and, uh, you know, moved in these houses, they got married and had family there. Like the paper said, I'm a seven child of 12 children. You know, uh, my older sister, she passed away, you know, back in 2006 with breast cancer. 
my baby brother, he passed away in 20, 2012 with um kidney, kidney disease. And I thank God that he allowed us to be able to be as close as we are with my sister and brothers. Uh, I love all of them, and I know they love me. They're a big supporter of us. And uh, beginning the quilt, my mother started me off when I was young. I remember when mama used to, uh, you know, sit down to the sewing machine to piece quilts together. She would always, you know, throw in the block of uh, fabric on the floor. And I would sit down by mama, you know, when she was doing it. Back then, uh, they didn't have no lecture sewing machine. They had these foot pedal sewing machine. That's the first back I can remember. And, uh, and the old I got it, and when they got to the point where they can't afford it, because a lot of stuff they had, they couldn't afford it. We had to work for so much. And like I told you, I'm, I didn't know I was poor because we had most of what we really needed to, to live on. The quilts came about because, um, you know, we didn't have no beds to lay in. Uh, Mama had to make quilts to put on the floor. She had to make quilts to cover up on them. You know, it was five of us girls, you know, sleeping in one room and three boys sleeping in the other room. But um, once my older sister, she graduated from high school, she left and moved to New York. Then my older brother, he graduated. Well, he didn't graduate, but he left and uh, moved to New York also. So as the children at G's Bend got older, they moved away from G's Bend because a lot of them um, didn't, was glad to get away from the cotton field because we know we picked cotton, whole cotton. We raised corn, peanuts, all kinds of stuff. Everything that we needed to eat or wanted to eat, we raised it on the farm. Peanut, corn, I mean, whatever we need, whole cows. We you know the cows, we're milking the cows for butter and milk. The whole, we're killing them for, for meat. And almost everybody in that community, you know, when somebody killed a hog, they'll help each other out. Just about everybody in the community would get a little piece of that meat or some hog crackers and some sweet potato, which was a good meal. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's a lot of stuff that, um, you know, we had to eat to get by, to live on. Right. You know, sometimes um, we used to have the, didn't have, uh, you know, the food that they have now to eat. You know, we had chicken, we had eggs. Uh, on this, this video that I have playing at the collective, and it played for an hour where Mr. Arnett is saying that Wilcox County is the poorest county, and G's Bend is one of the, um, the poorest community. I said he was wrong in my perspective. In my opinion, he was wrong. We was one of the, the richest community that I could see because God had blessed us with so much. We had our own land and our own homes, and I and that was a blessing. That's what I, I would say rich. We might not have been rich in money. Wow. In some ways, we are rich in many ways. We had our health and strength. And see, all the, the stuff that we was raising, we knew what we was putting in. And now we eat stuff. Now we don't know what's going in all this food and stuff. Well, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me stop you right there. I want to ask you, I want to ask Ms. Chyna. So tell me, what was your experience like growing up in Jesus then? Oh, it was rough. <laughs> So we was poor. My mama had, she had 10 children. And I was daddy, you know, he had left, went to Montgomery, married somebody else. And oh, I tell you, Mr. Harry, I married a pet way. You married a pet way? And he was not my brother. <laughs> <laughs> but, Every, you know, growing up in G's Bend, to me, it was rough. It was many days we didn't have food to eat. My mother, sometimes she'd have a little meal in the bar. She'd go get that meal and put some water in that big old pan and she had a little salt and she put it in there and she uh, just stirred it up, put a little grease in it. And you know what she called that? We called it hushamammy. <laughs> and it was good. It was just like, you know, like people make dress, and you know that you make dressing for Thanksgiving, you make that turkey and dressing, but we didn't have no bell pepper, no onion to put in it. 
but it was good. Because everything to me, my mother cook, it was good to me. Because <laughs> like, like May Rand say, they had food. Well, I'm being honest, y'all. It was some days we didn't have a, not a piece of bread. Oh, it was night. We went to bed hungry, and we got up hungry. Mm -hmm. And God knew I'm in heaven. He knew in heaven I'm telling the truth, because we had it hard. Many days, you know, it was freezing cold. And I wanted to go to school. And our house was sitting beside the highway. And I hear the children say, here come the bus. A lot of time, I slipped out the back door and, and ran out there and got on the bus, bare feet. Wow. But when my mama, I came home, I, I thought she was going to whoop me for that, but she didn't beat me. I want you to know when you with your class, man, you, you don't want to be left behind. Right. But I was left behind, behind in a uh, because of. I wonder if I don't know about both of you. Because, you know, obviously, it, it wasn't easy. Uh, but mm. you struggled to get an education. Right. And your parents, obviously, despite the poverty and the hunger and everything else, yeah. you, all, you both had a desire to get an education. Right. Talk a little bit about the education. Where did you go to school? I went to Sema University. I'm not right. elementary school. You didn't start off oh, in university, I'm, did you? Oh, I thought you were talking about that. In elementary, it was elementary. It's Boykin. High school. How far is that from? Is that in G's Bend? It's in G's Bend. Both of you tell me a little bit. It's in G's Bend. Yeah. Look, I couldn't find G's Bend on the map. I but it's on. You and, and, and so I. G's Bend, Boykin, Alabama. You tell us for a little bit what G's Bend and Boykin are relative to Alabama. Any city or other thing we might know about. It's near you ever heard of Alberta, Alabama. Camden, I don't know about Alabama, that either. You got Camden, Georgia. Alabama. Selma, Alabama. Oh, all right. Montgomery, <laughs> Alabama. Okay. Yeah. So how far is it from Selma? Well, uh, I said it'd be close to an hour of a ride. Okay. G's Bend. And, and tell, so anyway, G's Bend is how many people? Oh, I don't know. It was, it was some, but. I, I see, did, I did, uh, uh, you know, since back in, I think, mm -hmm. 20, 2000. But back then, it was like, whoa, about 500, 500 people was in G's Bend right now. Yeah. It may be. 250 to 300 people there. That's including the white people that moved in the neighborhood in, anyway. Because when the children graduated, you know, it was nothing, you know, job. Right. They went away. Uh, they went away yeah. to college and they, they went to get a job. Mm -hmm. They left G's Bend. And if I G's Bend Boykin, it's the uh, one you'll be looking for on the map. Mm -hmm. And that's what you'll see mostly now, you know, with the upgrading stuff, you may see G's Bend on some map, but it mostly it'll be Boykin. Yeah. And boy, the Boykin central Alabama. part of Alabama, you know, between um, like 40, 45 minutes, approximately drive from Selma or 40 minutes from Camden. Okay. And, you know, come from Camden, now that they got the ferry, the state broke down a whole lot. Mm -hmm. yes. Especially when they made all the electricity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but when we got a chance to ride it, we rode it. I, I bought a car back in 2007. And uh, when I went to get the car, um, I had to drive it back around. So now I asked the guy, I said, well, do y'all deliver the car? He said, yes. I said, well, I tell you what, had you rode the ferry yet? He said, no. I said, well, you can drive the car over, you know, on the ferry. When I looked on the dashboard, the car had 13 miles on it. And so when he got it to my, in my driveway, it had 20 miles. So I assumed that's what it was, seven miles from Camden across the ferry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but to drive around on the ferry, it's like 40 Minutes, because when I did the U.S. Census, we had to, uh, you know, write down our mileage, how far we had to go. So the the headquarters for us to go from G's Bend to County was like 40 miles. So that's how I know it's it was like seven miles from County across the field. Well, let me ask you both a question. Um, I told you about my family being from Arkansas, Tucker and Pine Bluff. Well, basically, Arkansas's motto is Arkansas is the land of opportunity. And for my family, the opportunity was to get up and get out. Um, wow. I only got one cousin left in Arkansas. <laughs> uh, you know, we heard about runaway slaves. Why'd you guys stay? It wasn't civil rights. You know, you could have left. Yeah. Uh, you got out of high school, you got an education, yeah. uh, you could have gone in the military, got jobs, government jobs, or just left 
not uh-huh. only the town, but the state. Why did you stay? And what have you been doing? Obviously, you've been doing the quilting, but you've done more than that when to I, survive yeah. this long. Yeah, when I finished high school, yes, I left too, but Where'd I came go? back. <laughs> oh, you, where'd you go? Tell me that. Well, uh, at first, uh, when I finished high school in 75, then, uh, you know, after I got out of high school, I went to Job Co for a few months. And when I went there, it was like a prison camp to me because, see, I had never went to a place where, uh, you know, the dormitory didn't have no doors on. And they said it was like a prison camp because the place that I went to, Morganfield, Kentucky, they said it was like over 2,000 men there. And so and they, and they said that the men that were there told them if they bring women there at that, uh, that job code, they will let allow us to stay in the new dorm and they'll get in the old dormitory. And so that's what they did. They took the men out of the dorm, those of the dormitory and put us in the new dormitory. So it was like 500 of us women that went there. And uh, so it got to a point, I think I had been there about three months. And when we needed to call home, they were, actually they were treating us just like prisoners because they were eavesdropping on our phone call. You couldn't just, get up and go because you want to go. It Somebody in your family had to be dead or dying in order to get out of there. I thank God for my mother and my cousin. She and I was there at that Morganfield, Kentucky, and she got my cousin out first. Cause, uh, and my cousin told me, she said, Mary Ann, I sure thank God for Big Annie. That's what they were calling my mama, Big Annie. She said, I thank God for Big Annie bringing me home first. She tried to get, when my mama tried to get me out, she actually had to tell a lie. You know, sometimes you have to tell a lie and ask God to forgive you for it later on. Yeah. In order to get, you know, help. And so in order for me to get out, she got in touch with the doctor. And uh, she found this man in the hospital dying. And when the doctor told her, well, little mate, if she, you need, she need to see her granddaddy, she need to bring her, you know, they had to bring her home. So she called, she even, my mama was a smart woman. She didn't finish high school. The highest grade she finished was sixth grade. She told that doctor, that was my granddad, and she told, went to the doc, uh, to the funeral home and talked with Brownlee, uh, you know, he was uh, Brownlee Funeral Home, and him. talked to him and told him about it. And so in order for them to, to, for her to bring me home, they had to call the funeral home and the doctor's office and talk to them in order for me to get out of uh-huh. that, that place. That's why it was like a prison right. camp. And when they sent me home, they gave me a round trip ticket. I said, people don't think I'm crazy. I'm not coming back. <laughs> you don't think crazy. Let me ask you. So, so after, after you came back mm-hmm. from the uh, Job Corps Center, mm-hmm. did you stay then? Uh, well, I left home for a little while, and I moved to Mobile. OK. And I stayed there for, uh, you know, for a few years and found a babysitting job. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, I was looking for a job because I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do when I got out of high school. And so when I got pregnant in 78 with my daughter, and when I got pregnant with her, I moved back home and had my daughter there. Okay. And once I had my daughter there, I stayed there and I'm still there. So what, what, did you, what have you done? I'm gonna, I sure don't want to get to Miss China. So what did you do to survive? You know, you're in a small town, a few hundred people, uh, you know, obviously not a lot of jobs. What did you do? Well, uh, when I did move back to, oh, well, it was a sewing factory in Selma. Okay. And so then uh, my aunt had called and asked me, did I want to work? I told her, yes, I want to work. And see, my mother, she was uh, was keeping my daughter. Actually, I put her in, in daycare when she was three months old. So mama was home for her to, uh, to pick her up when she come home from school. And so when I worked in Selma at the sewing factory from 1980 up until it closed down in 1999. Wow. And that's why I worked, you know, while we was making army uniforms okay. and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. what about you? Okay. I went away to North Carolina with my oldest sister. Did you go to high school? No. After, you know, I finished college. Oh, yeah, okay. But I, I just didn't like up there. I told my oldest sister I was going to go back home because my mother, she was sick. She was a, had high blood pressure, and she was a diabetic. How, how, long, I, you, how long do you live in North Carolina? A couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I came back, I got me a job doing home health. 
I was, you know, I was going around, you know, to the people how, you know, working at if, home. If you, if been? No, it was since Selma, wow. Camden, and uh, Tomerville, and Safra, Alabama. And I enjoyed, I loved it that. I wanted to help my mother because uh, with my youngest sister and brother, and while she was being sick, I wanted to come home and, you know, and help her. So that's what I did. I, and I, when I got there, my brother, they left. After they finished, they left and they went on somewhere. They went, on, they went to college. And my, my baby brother and my other brother, they left. I said, Lord, if I know this, I will stay in <laughs> North Carolina. So, I, so my mama always, I'm a stud child. My mama stood a child. She always depend on me, you know, by. to stand by. I was the strongest one out of my oldest brother and my oldest sister. My mama, she always looked yeah. to me for more help. That's beautiful. Yeah. So let me this. So, okay. So I understand you left. You both had a chance to leave, but you came back yeah. for various reasons. Uh, and then you stayed. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, how you both got into quilting. I know I heard kind of, I know at least one of you at a really early age, and I don't know, and I'm sure you all had some familiarity with sewing and quilting just because it was necessary. Yeah. You know, that when you wouldn't you wouldn't go to the local tailor, yeah. you didn't sew your own clothes or yeah. own other kind. You wouldn't have anything to wear or any quilt or anything on the bed. So yeah. at what point did you both learn a little bit about sewing and particularly to learn about quilting? So I'm gonna start. Well, how I got into quilting when our mother put up a quilt. We had to quilt. We was made to quilt. We not, you know, I didn't want to do it sometime, but I did it. And I thank God the day that I well, no, decided. What, what, what did you make the quilts out of? Old clothes. Okay. But we know like the you know, clothes, like the skirt and the dress, the shirt and the pants and the blind got old. My mother, you know, she always cut the bird. They got that best piece. And she, you know, she spread the needle for us. We had that old round ball white thread. Right. And Lord have mercy. We had to do it till I sat down. I liked it, you know, everything my mama did, I wanted to be like my mama. Right. That's why I wanted to come home and be with my mama, you know, help her out. So my first quilt I made, it was a star. You know? About how old were you? I was nine years old okay. when I made my first quilt. It wasn't it was made from nothing new, you know, like I say. Well, what, did, what did you stuff it with? Well, I stuffed with cotton. Okay. That old cotton, you know, they were getting from the gin, you know, when they go and take those those bales of cotton, we go there, people go in there and get the scrap. And you know, we got the scrap, we had to put it on the front porch and get a stick and beat it and beat it. Right. And then sweep that up, put it down again, beat it and beat it. And then after that, we took it inside the house in the living room and we had to beat it on that, old, you know, that liner. And then we paired it out. We got it. You know, during those days, we used to, it used to hang, quilt used to hang from the law of the house. And Lord have mercy. Jesus. When we, we, we used to come from school, my mama had that little food she'd be done cook. She'd have it ready. She'd tell y'all, she'd tell us to eat, get your homework, because we had to quilt until 10 o'clock wow. that night. Jesus. Then at, at 10 o'clock, see, we know they draw that quilt up in the ceiling. And the next morning, you know, and I'm so glad, you know, people, you know, in the neighborhood, our parents, they made their own quilt top. But like three or four ladies that in the neighborhood, they always used to come and help quilt. Oh. They stay at my mother's oh. house until they quit it, her quit out. Then in, when they got my mother quit out, they went to the next So neighborhood. the idea of a collective is not new in terms of quilt. No, we ain't know nothing about no collection then. Uh, what about you? I, you started at an earlier age learning how to quilt, right? Yes, my mama taught me how to make a block at the age of uh, between six and seven years old. It was a nine patch, like I was saying earlier. When she was sewing on the sewing machine, she always just throw pieces on the floor. Then she saw me interested in it, and she said, well, Mary Ann, let me show you how to make this nine patch. And a nine patch is, is I guess, kind of like one of the easy ones she can t teach me at that age. So she gave me a needle and thread, and that's how I put it together. And it's it's five of one color and uh then it's yeah, it's five of one color and four of another color. But you can make it any with any colors that you would like to make with. 
But uh, then when we got the age, between the age of 14, 10 and 14 years old, this is, well, let me show you how to quilt. Don't get me wrong, no, I did not want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said earlier, she made us did it. And I, I can't, she's dead and gone. I can't thank mom enough for making me doing this. Amen. Because if she never had, Amen. I wouldn't be here today. Amen. Well, so obviously, you learned it. Uh, it's, it was a useful tool. You yes. found a way to apply it to so many other things. So what gave birth to the Jeans Bend Collective? What is, what, how did that start? Now, I started before I did, but I started in 2005. Okay, all right. And, well, let, me, um, let, me, let her start, okay. and I want you to pick it up. Okay. So how, how did it start? Okay, in the latter part of 1999, the Ardenet came from Atlanta, Georgia. And they, uh, what he did, he saw, uh, I don't see one with, no, with that book. That lady had her quilt draped across a pile of wood. And he said, I have to find that lady. And he did. He came down there and, just, and he found her. And she sold him that quilt. And uh, during that time when uh, he was at her house, uh, Miss Anna Mae Young and Miss Anna Mae Young and Alonzo, his cousin, he called Alonzo and she called, Miss Anna Mae Young called Alonzo and told him it's a crazy white man was up there. <laughs> Paying good money for some old quilt. <laughs> and my mother and Alonzo called my mama and told her. Then my mama told me. And what I was done, I I, I had, had some quilt pieced up. I, I went and I had the night looking quilt. But when he came to my house, he said, No, he was looking for art. Because when we was going to school, they didn't tell us nothing about art. <laughs> when I found out about art, that's when the Arnett had came down from George and discovered that we was doing art. I didn't know nothing about art. And it really was art. So when he got that quilt, he paid me some good money for that quilt. I, I wanted to give him that pretty quilt. You know, during then, you know, we, you, you don't want to give people anything. Right. No, but he looked up under my sofa. He got that old, old ragged quilt. And he said it was art. <laughs> So from that day on, I discovered that we was doing art. <laughs> but I didn't, I, I didn't make it. I didn't make no more old quitter. I was able then to go and buy some material and get some, get me some new material of the money he paid me for that quilt. I was able to go in and shop, get my children's shoes, clothes, get food, pay bills. And I thank God. Right, right. right. I thank God. So, so, okay, I got, I got that. So when other people said, we want to make art too, uh, how, how did you form a group? Uh, and since obviously it was about six years before Mary Ann joined, so tell me about the beginning of the collective. Who were some of the beginning members of the, how many were you? And, and for the six years before Marianne got involved, were you just making quilts and, and how did you begin it, selling them? Just like I say, it was another lady before Mary Ann. She was Rennie Young. She was, during that time, she was uh, over the collection and she kept those quilts in her house. So she, had something else she wanted to do. And she said she was tired, you know, people, you know, coming to her house, you know, anytime in, at night, waking her up, bringing quilts, you know. So uh, she just, uh, maybe when did you turn, she turned it over. When they just. I started in 2005. You know, they had asked me to be the manager. Oh. I, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be no manager, you know, Jeff, I know what you gonna be. Cause Mary Ann, I thank God for Mary Ann. Mary Ann doing too. a good job. Mary Ann, y'all, she doing a wonderful job with the thank quilt you. collection. Thank you. Thank okay, you. now I'm gonna ask before I go to Mary Ann, one last question. So in the six years or seven years between when you started mm -hmm. uh, uh, doing the quilting and, and Mary Ann took over as the manager, so how did you begin to sell them? I mean, obviously, 
everybody wasn't going to G's Bend to find your quilt. So somebody must have either came and got them and, and sold them, and you went out and started ex exhibiting them so people yeah. would understand the art mm -hmm. that you've now developed. Okay. Then we went, we started traveling, and our first quilt trip was, I think it was to, what Houston. the real world, Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, two buffalo went to Houston, Texas. And uh, they, and when the audience, they came out, they got a lot of those quilts. They're like, you see these quilts, this quilt hanging. Right. They took them to Texas and had them hung, they were hanging everywhere. Let me tell you something. When I got there and I looked on at that wall at that old, old my ugly quilt, I said, wow, that quilt looked that good. <laughs> to me, it looked good because they had cleaning and everything. But that, how you know, so many people, ladies from Alberta and different places, they were, they were taking quilt to, you know, so it's ran a house. So that's why she had to give it up. Because she said she was tired of people coming to her house anytime, night, knocking on her door, waking her up. Mm -hmm. So I was glad they went there and knocked on her door and woke but how, her up. How long, how long take to make a quilt? Oh, Jesus. It, it, uh, it all depends on what size you okay. want. Okay, size. Okay, you're a small one. And what is a small quilt and what is a large quilt? I know they're they made to go on beds originally. This one behind me, one I made, it took me approximately a week to make this quilt. From, from cutting to finish and quilting it. Because, see, I stayed on this quilt. When I started on it, I just went on and worked on it until I finished it. It's like a um, fit, like a, a, a baby to a bed quilt. And seeing the other one, the small wall hangers, maybe something like this, maybe a few hours to take me to do something about this size. Mm -hmm. It all depends on what size you're making. Yeah. I, I made a queen size quilt for a friend of mine um, back in 2021, I believe that's when it was. Mm -hmm. And from start to finish, I decided to time myself because a lot of my quilts I don't time myself on mm -hmm. because I don't stay on it all the time. Yeah. So when I, I decided to time myself from cutting the fabric to finish quilting that quilt all together it was a queen size quilt. I still tell myself today I don't believe I did it. From the January the first until February the fifth, I was shipping that quilt out to Washington. Well, why, why did you join the collective? I was joined the co co collective to travel with the ladies and to sell my work and sing with them. Okay, that's all I wanted to do. But for somehow or another, they saw in me to ask me to be the manager. Okay. In 2005, when I joined them, uh, my daughter grandmother, which is the boy's great grandmother, Alonzo Petway, I used to visit her a lot. And uh, when she was um, going to the nutrition center, and when I think that she done made a home, I didn't have no job, I had lost a job at that time. So I, I just go visit her at her house. And so she would tell me, oh good, we have such a wonderful time on these trips that we're going to the exhibit. And I said, Lawrence, I'm tired of you telling me what a good time you have. I want to have one, too. <laughs> so, so she told me she's a star back to quilting. And so, see, Mama already had done taught me the basic. And so when, she, when Mama had taught me the basic, and Lawrence told me to start back to quilting, I didn't start when she told me. I just kept visiting her, kept visiting And then I would get to the point I was feeling sorry for myself, getting depressed. And so I finally started uh, working on quilts because she used to have this elderly man and woman from Birmingham bringing down fabric. And she would call the ladies that was involved in the quilt collective to come to her house and get boxes of fabric. And so she asked uh, myself and her granddaughter that was living there, told us to uh, get these boxes off this truck. And when the ladies come, they was going through. She said, no, don't go through and get the whole box. Because see, somebody had sent the fabric to them. And so she said, whatever you do with it, once you get it, that's up to you. Mm -hmm. And so after I joined uh, the quilt collective, and I only had been in for like maybe five or six months. And in January of 2006, that's when they asked me to be the manager. Okay. And we had a busload of people from Atlanta, Georgia, come down with Senator John Lewis was on that bus, came to visit us. And uh, cause we had a, a show at High Museum was gonna be uh, in March of that year. And they wanted to come down and visit first before we came to Atlanta. But uh, my grandson, Deshaun, the oldest one, hold your hand up Deshaun. That's my oldest one. That's my inspiration also. Okay. This young man, when he was about three years old, he told me I spread a quilt. I did a nine-pack block over my bed. And when I did that quilt, 
He walked in the room. He said, oh, Ma, that's pretty. I like it. I looked back at this little boy. I said, oh, my God. That was the first, the longest sentence this boy said since he started talking. <laughs> How many, how many members are in the collective? Well, when I started, it was like fifth latest. That's what was told to me. And I have a, a, you know, a photograph of all the latest that started uh, before I started. And we had we don't have about uh, 12 to 15 of them passed on. And now it's only a few of us that still producing work. China, myself, and my sister Julia, sorry that she wouldn't be able to be here. She had a bad accident right. and she couldn't make it. And uh, when uh, China and I be there a lot. The other ladies, they don't come and utilize the building like we do. They stay at home and do their work, and then they bring it there to be. Okay. Yes, document okay. and sold so, there. So tell me some of the places. You mentioned Houston, Texas. Uh, what are some of the other places that uh, you traveled to uh, and shown the, uh, told the story of the Jesus being collected? Now, uh, June, the June Collar Museum in Auburn, Alabama, was my very first trip when I traveled with them. And I went, uh, I, you know, when I, I sold my, my first quilt in June of 2005, that's when the lady said, oh, you can join us, start traveling with us. I said, oh, I can. They said, yes. And my uh, friend, daughter, grandmother, Alonzo Pitway, told me, she said, Mary Ann, we met her. Now, you know how to sing. He got worried. You have to I said, well, that's fine. I only could do the part that God allowed me to be able to do. Yeah. And so from then on, then we, we made a CD. But the one that we made with Matt, we never got a copy of that. And then uh, in 2006, I believe, we made another CD. I'm sorry, y'all, we don't have any with us. Sorry. But uh, anyway, we're to give you the right, the right thing from us, you know. We'll sing a little bit from you. But, but uh, <laughs> it was the High Museum. I'm going to tell you one that I can remember. Um, and uh, I was got a chance to take my daughter, my son-in-law, and Deshaun, when you're, you know, a little younger to the museum uh, in Houston, Texas in 2006. That's when they did the, uh, I mean, the I just take off the Quilt Museum uh, exhibit. Is that in Houston? Yeah, Houston, Texas. Thanks. And so then um, I don't went to, let's see, I hadn't been there. I, I didn't come to California to the one, but a friend of mine brought me to the Dion Museum and saw some quilts on okay. display. And uh, I, uh, we don't, I'd have been to, um, Oxford, uh, Mississippi, with a display. I, oh, I've been to so many places. All right. <laughs> yeah, like that. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, like first of all, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. And, Thank y'all for having us. Look, this is obviously a, a labor of love. You've been able to turn it into something to benefit your family, and more importantly, something that really tells a story that goes back generations far, far back between all of us, uh, where quilting was a matter of survival. Yes. Uh, it wasn't just something you did because you didn't have anything else to do or because you were even trying to make a little money. You didn't have anything else to put on your bed or put on the floor for your children to lie on. And now we see that it was a work of beauty where people took a little and made it into a lot. A lot, and yes. I, and you carried on that tradition. And we're just, mm -hmm. just pleased and, and thankful that you came here to share us with us your story and your inspiration. So thank you both for that. And well, yes, thank you. And, and before, and before the question, you know, Joyce Gordon, you know, if you haven't been to her art gallery, uh, she presents unique that sometimes people don't appreciate. We think of Da Vinci and we think of other art pieces, but art is a creative form of expression. And what these ladies have done with quilts is not only unique, but you can hear the museum, the quilt museum, and other places where it's exhibited. So I hope you'll have a chance to go to the opening and really see uh, this art and learn a little bit more about the specific pieces that they've developed, because quite frankly, uh, these ladies are pioneers, and quite frankly, they're carrying on a tradition that is incredible. And uh, again, we're gifted to not only learn about it, but now have a chance to look at it and see it, not only here, but also in the Joyce Gordon Gallery. Thank you for those flowers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So at this time, we'll, we will um, transition to the questions 
um, that were passed in from everyone here today. And I want to apologize in advance because <clears throat> we will not get to get to all of the questions, but fortunately, some of them do kind of overlap and have similar themes, so um, they'll be touched on. And we did have a request for somewhere near the end, if you all feel like singing. Uh, oh, be to have so, but with, so the first question um, is, can you speak to the theme of piecing, piecing together, making that is done by black quilt making? And what are some of the unconventional functions of quilts in everyday life? And what are their significance? To the demon. Let's go to the manager first. Well, well, we probably gonna ask amp that question, but yeah. but piece the quilt together. All you have to do is get uh, you know, get some fabric and uh cut out the colors that you want and piece it together. When I start putting piecing the quilt together, I always cut out some strips like one, two, three, or five mm -hmm. inches wide. And so I don't have to keep getting up to cut out, cut out, and I start piecing it together. If I wanted to make a nine patch, I would sit there and cut my five colors that I want and my four colors. Then I start sewing three of them together. Uh, and then I join all of them together and make a nine patch block. Would that answer the question? Well, Charlie, yeah. what are some other uses for the quilts as you heard the question, beside obviously putting them on the bed? Okay. During those times, you know, like I'm saying, we were sleeping in our house and it wasn't so good. We hung quilts on the wall to keep the wind out, on the window, and on the door. And then I had to put some on the bed. And those quilts, I tell you, we used to play on the ground, you know, spread a quilt out there in the yard on the ground. You know, we didn't know nothing, like I say, for say, we didn't know nothing about no art. And we just laid, you know, just played on those quilts. You know, so sweet. So obviously quilts are sort of, a lot, a lot of people do tapestry. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, I guess they're like tapestry. You can hang on the wall like an art piece, yeah. uh, as opposed to just putting it on the bed yeah. and also hang it. Yeah. And also we yeah. used it, you know, like when they got so rackly. Mm -hmm. I don't remember, we done cut a quilt up and made it out of mop. mop you know, we got a stick and put uh, put a hole in the part that was so racked and put on it and made mops out of it. And and mop the floor with, you know, we, I told you, we didn't have that much. We couldn't afford to buy mops like we do now. Mm -hmm. And we used the, 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 the cotton that was in those quilts. We set it afire and burned it, smoking mosquitoes. You know, that also helped. There's many ways these quilts yeah. were used in and different that's ways. That's part of the tradition of poor people. You, you, nothing goes to waste. No, nothing. We also used them when, you know, during the time they put a hog up. And then the, my mother would make us go out there and, and you know, build it full up for the hog. And you had to spread that old quilt it and putting those hawks on those quilts, those rags. And I think that that's a, uh, when you, you said, both of you have re referenced your mothers several times as, as um, the inspiration behind you all getting, getting started. Yes. This next question uh, is, are the quilting skills being passed on to the next generation? And how do you do that? And how do you host workshops for, for young people? Well, the ones that want to learn, of course we're passing on to it, because. Like my, my grandson, Deshaun and Alex, I started with them when they were seven years old. And so uh, once they got into it, they loved it. And, and so that's why they will still make quilts today. The only the one that wants to learn, we'll be happy to teach them. And these workshops that China now and I are now about the flexible one that's travel, be able to go and do these workshops. Uh, matter of fact, you know, right after we leave here, we'll be heading back to Mississippi and about two weeks to do a, uh, a workshop retreat for five days. We only teach, you know, the ones that wants to do it, mm -hmm. they got to, got to be able to want to do That's right. this, uh, these quilts. And another question that went along with that is, how often do you travel in th the different places that you, that you travel to? Oh, since this pandemic, oh my God. Yeah. We're doing a lot of, and now, I mean, this year, we had a workshop February, I mean, February, March, April, May, June. We can have one in September, October, and November. And December, May. No, not December. I mean, I mean, four of them are going to be in Mississippi. Right. So we do be there for five days. And uh, one of them in uh, April going to be in uh, Camp McDowell for four days. Then we asked to come to Trustville, Alabama. 
the last part of um, April. Then we asked to fly to New York for a few days, also in April. So people just love us. Thank y'all. <laughs> <laughs> About how, many, about how many students might there be in a workshop? Well, in Mississippi, um, we had actually not to have no more than 20, if possible. But in Mississippi, it's be 40 of us and all wow. in that workshop. Mm -hmm. Wow. So on the flip side of that yeah. question, when you're not traveling, someone asked, if they were to visit Alabama, is there a gallery, a store, or a museum in G's Bend that people it's a can store, go to? It's, it's a store down in G's Bend. Uh, that's what we sell our equipment out of. And that's why China and I spend uh, the majority of the day there working when we don't have a doctor appointment or have other engagement. That's what we'll be working. And matter of fact, my son, Alex, grandson, Alex, he do have some of my uh, business cards with him. I don't have enough. <laughs> they, they but I do have a few. You want to take pictures and get the number? Oh. You know, I tell them to call me. I don't have a lot of people say they look on the Internet, and that's how they find me because my daughter said, Mom, you, you stay doing what you're doing right. Because if you do wrong, you all over the internet. <laughs> so I try to live the best way I know how to live. Yep. I don't want right. to get in trouble. Yes. I want to be able to continue on traveling, right. telling people about this, right. sharing this with you all that wants to know and uh, learn from us. Whatever right. we can teach you that our parents already had taught us, we'd love to do it. Right. Right. right on. Go ahead. All right, we have two more. Okay. So one is a, a very specific question for you, Marianne. Would you please tell us about why you chose the title Just After Vacuuming for one of your quilts? <laughs> well, Ashley, I was vacuuming the, uh, the collector, you know, sprucing up a little bit. And when I finished vacuuming, it's like I had so much energy. I said, you know what, I'm going to sit down and make this block. And once I finish, I was one of my name. So just ask the vacuum. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. <laughs> Thank you. So, so, the, so the next couple, of, well, a few questions, they all kind of synthesized together. But basically, people want to know how you visualize the quilt prior to starting. What is your process? Do you just start it? It comes along. But really, what is the process around how you envision this? I, I don't. I, I don't plan. I mean, I want to I'll come back to you because okay. you're trying uh, to start. I want, what first thing, you know, I pick out my fabric, and I love beautiful color. And blue, what's my favorite color? But I see so many beautiful color coming out now. I don't know who what my favorite color is. So I just when I go in a fabric store, I just get a lot of different color, and I pick out my fabrics like my rainforest say. I cut, you know, strips. You know, when I cut my strip. Then I sit down at my machine after I get all those strips, and I'm going to decide what pattern I want to make. Sometimes I get a quilt by this side. If I don't like that pattern, I would take it all loose and start over. And uh, with a, a good sewing machine and uh, my mind focusing on what I want to do, I will make that quilt in three days' time. Because wow. I have a quilt at home. It's a flower garden. And it's a, I haven't quit it yet. I had started on that quilt before my mother passed. And uh, my mother passed in uh, December 2010. But when I, I was looking in my closet and I find that quilt. So I finished that quilt up. And it is a king side quilt. Mm -hmm. And when I finished that quilt up, I'm going to name it after my mama. Right. Yes, on, on that, so when you start with a pattern, and, mm -hmm. and what what is, uh, the, are there various certain patterns or just creative as you do it? You know, as you sew it, you just sitting at the machine sewing, you can look around on the wall, just uh, look down, look, just look in it on the float. Yeah, I can look down there and get a pattern, you know. Then, like I said, if it don't suit me, if I don't like it, I take it out there and, and you know, and do another pattern. So, so most of them are all different because you, you don't know what you're going to do if you start doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's right. That's right. So I'm being passed a couple more, but I did see um, how does practicing your culture enrich the ability to be consciously awake and aware of the world? That's a deep one. Repeat that again. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. 
how does practicing culture enrich our ability to be conscious, awake, and aware of the world? Wow. Oh, wow. That is a deep question. <laughs> Sounds like one of those Freedom Center youth. <laughs> We can ask that person to uh, put that a little bit more so I can understand exactly what you're saying. I, I think what you're trying to say, I think, I, I think what you're trying to say is, and part of it, your presence here okay. answers the question. Yeah. Okay. Because we're talking about sharing something that you see as what you do. We're trying to understand all the ramifications that it means. It's not just a simple work of putting material together. It's history. Okay. It's art. Right. It's Necessity, it's all the things that sometimes we don't understand how many art forms developed. Yeah. Because people yeah. didn't do it to show art, they yeah. did it to survive. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's I, you're right. Because right. what people do to who, survive and ultimately become part of the culture mm -hmm. and becomes embroidered into the culture mm -hmm. of their lives as it has been for you. So when I, when I do start piecing a quilt together, I don't have, I'm not. Envision anything in mind. I tried drawing, drawing it on paper at first, but it don't work. Because my mind changed like the wind. My sister stayed telling me, she's made around your mind changed just like the wind. I, I mean, it's just, when I started piecing it together, I sit there, I love to use real small little bit of pieces you can barely see. And I would sit there, I said, all I want to do is get a seam on that piece. And I get that seam on that piece, I go with it. And I just build from there. It almost, I didn't be okay. thinking about building a house, which I never built a house before. Because a quilt is like building a house. It's like building a life together. Amen. You joining, you know, people are joining yeah. in with you, right. helping you. Now, I love working by myself. I do all my quilting by myself. Because, see, I have a different way of uh, quilting. I don't have some people come there and watch me sit there at the sewing machine, quilting on a quilt. I mean, at the frame, quilt on a quilt. I have thread so long on that quilt. I could be, I could get up from that quilt from here over there with that thread. And one lady told me, you, she said, that's the first time I ever seen anybody quilt with thread that long. I said, well, I'm a very patient person, and I just take my time in the thread that I quilt with. That's some of the best quilting thread I ever quilt with. It's, it's called 100% uh, gladed cotton. It's like um, if it get tangled, I just pick it up and shake it, shake it. and it's come yeah. apart. And I, like I told you, I'm very patient. And once I it get in a knot, I would even sit there and unknot it because it's, I just sit there and take my time. I have my lights so I can see. Thank God, uh, earlier part of last year, been a year now, I got to the point where Mr. Roy was talking about he was reading something he couldn't hardly see. I got to that point, both of my eyes, the doctor told me I had cataract in both my eyes. My left eye was worse off than my right eye. In um, January of, of uh, 2022, I had uh, cataract surgery on my left eye. And when I had cataract surgery on my left eye and I got home, I had a quilt laying on the floor. And I used to have people come in there, oh my God, it is a beautiful quilt. And I, and I didn't really see that at the time. And then when I had my, my right eye cataract surgery, Ooh, y'all, I was oh my God, no wonder. <laughs> I can see clearly now. <laughs> you know, I, I still need glass to read yeah. close up, but I can see all this. I don't have to wear glass to uh, drive with no more. Thank God for that. And I just, you know, they thank God that I can see the colors more better now. Because if you got cataract in your eye, it was looking like I was looking through a muddy glass of water. Mm -hmm. And once they fixed that, I said, oh, thank you for giving doctors the knowledge to do this, right. to fix my eyes and I could come out and see. And the same day I have that cataract surgery, you know, they have a patch on my eye, but once they took that patch on my eye, I could see clear that day. And I said, I know this ain't nothing, nobody but the Lord that did this. Right. And so, and I just can't thank him enough. Amen. So the last question is, everyone wants to know, how can we best support the collective? Is it fundraising, donation, purchasing quilts? How can we best support the collective? Just buy our work and send us the donation. All right, all right. Yeah. Thank you. Let's give it up. Let's give it up. Stand up for the line. Stand up. Stand up.
or be seen in. Okay, my special request, if you want to, you all can grace us with your singing. I'm going to stay singing. All right, please do that. Of course we will. All right. Let me wet my shop a little bit. Yep. Yeah. No, the song that I'm, I'm, I'm about to sing is song. Um, I don't want nobody to face know me when I'm gone. Thank you, Lord. Give me my flower while I yet live. This is what you all have done. Give us, giving us all our flowers. I don't want nobody to praise me when I'm gone. I'm um, 
Check, check, check. Wow. 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 If you all don't leave here inspired, I don't know what else what else to say. <laughs> Thank you for that commercial break. We now go back to our regular scheduled program. <laughs> In closing, I just want to uh, mention that um, our Freedom Center uh, youth have made some painting on the little rocks. Um, there are a limited number available, but if you are um, so fortunate enough to get one on your way out, um, they, they, they are available until the supply is gone. Um, with that, I want to thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, this has been truly an inspiring event. And I want to close out with one more resounding round of applause for our Wilters.